Hello and welcome to Vantage This Week. If you missed our show over the last few days, then this is for you. A complete roundup of the week gone by, the biggest developments, the most important newsmakers, and of course, the analysis. It's been two weeks since Hamas attacked Israel. Since then, almost 5,000 people have been killed. Israel is gearing up for its ground offensive. In Gaza, the siege continues to worsen. There is no food, no water, and no electricity. And while Gazans suffer in the Strip, Hamas leaders enjoy a luxurious life abroad. We're bringing you that report. Meanwhile, US President Joe Biden visited Israel. What did that visit look like? Did he achieve anything, anything concrete? We'll tell you. Also, West Asia is up in arms. They're picking a side in this conflict. And that side is not Israel. But while the war may be in West Asia, a new front has opened in US campuses. We'll tell you why. Why is the world shying away from calling Hamas terrorists? And a look at how Israel's iron beam works. We'll discuss all this and more. Let's get started. Day 14 of the war, Israel's allies are joining the action, namely the United States. They've got a lot of firepower in West Asia and on Thursday it was put to use. The target, Yemen's Houthi rebels. Missiles and drones were fired from Yemen. The assumption is that they were headed to Israel. And that's when a U.S. warship, the USS Kani, sprung into action. It shot down three missiles, also several Houthi drones. The Pentagon has confirmed this operation. They've also said they will do it again if necessary. This action was a demonstration of the integrated air and missile defense architecture that we have built in the Middle East and that we are prepared to utilize whenever necessary to protect our partners and our interests in this important region. Now, the Kani is a destroyer. It was stationed in the Red Sea, but American assets are spread all over the region. Like in the Eastern Mediterranean, there are two U.S. aircraft carriers there, the USS Gerald Ford and the USS Dwight Eisenhower. Now, the idea here is to deter outside actors. But these American assets are also targets. Many of them have been hit this week. On Tuesday, Iraq's Al-Assad base was targeted by drones. The base hosts American soldiers and assets. The attacks caused minor injuries. The same day, there was another attack to the north on the Bashur Air Base. Again, drones were used, but no injuries. On Wednesday, U.S. forces in Syria were attacked. Two drones targeted at the Al-Tanf garrison. Both were destroyed. That same day, there were attack alerts in Iraq as well at the Al-Assad base. The U.S. soldiers decided to take cover, but the attack never came. It did on Thursday, though. Drones and rockets hit the same military base. Reports say multiple blasts were heard inside. Rockets also hit U.S. forces near Baghdad. Now, that's a lot of attacks in three days. Who is behind them? Possibly Iranian proxies. Last week, they threatened to attack U.S. assets in Iraq and Syria. Looks like they were serious about it. But these groups are playing a dangerous game. There are 2,500 American soldiers in Iraq, another 900 in Syria. The casualties so far have been negligible. But if there is a major attack, the U.S. could get drawn in. And they have enough firepower to retaliate, to hit back hard. Whether that happens or not depends on many factors. And the biggest one of them is Israel's next move. A lot depends on that, what is Israel decides to do next. Right now, Israel is striking Gaza nonstop. Even civilian sites and shelters are being targeted. The death toll has crossed 4,000. More than 1,500 of them are children. Violence has also spread to the West Bank. On Thursday, Israel conducted an airstrike there. Reports say 12 Palestinians were killed. Now, this is rare for Israel. They do deploy soldiers into the West Bank, but airstrikes are rare. So far, around 70 Palestinians have died in the West Bank, plus around 800 arrested. Things could get even worse if Israel invades Gaza. In fact, they are bracing for it. The Muslim world has united against Israel. There are street protests across Muslim capitals. So Israel has made a drastic move. They've decided to pull out diplomats. Israeli officials have started to leave Turkey. Reports say they are considering similar moves in other Western countries as well, West Asian countries. The problem seems to be security. Let's assume that Israel invades Gaza. Then the public anger would be much more. Israeli missions and diplomats would be prime targets, hence the withdrawal. Regional and world powers have already warned of this. They're expecting a wider war. 
As for the Gaza Strip, the risk of this crisis escalating into a regional conflict is quite serious. I have already mentioned that the United States vetoed a resolution that called for a stop to any hostilities and to begin to resolve humanitarian issues. And if this is so, then they will probably believe the conflict may grow. We hope to have better news, but honesty requires us to say that we fear for the worst. Everything indicates that the worst is yet to come. We are working with all our capabilities to prevent that. The worst is yet to come. For once, that's not fear-mongering. It's a fairly honest assessment. Take a look at these pictures. The Israeli army released them. They show airstrikes across the Israel-Lebanon border. That's the northern front. Things have been heating up there in the last few days, especially after the Gaza hospital attack. On Wednesday, Hezbollah struck targets on the Israeli side. Smoke was seen rising from the border hills. Of course, Israel struck back. They have stationed plenty of tanks and soldiers near the northern border. They're also evacuating people. The city of Kiryat Shimona has been struck by Hezbollah rockets. So it's 20,000 residents have now been asked to leave. There is a no-go zone near the border. It's around two kilometers wide. So Israel is bracing for an escalation in the north, a possible attack by the Iran-backed Hezbollah. However, their main focus is down south, and that is the Gaza Strip. Both Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his defense minister visited the front lines. They interacted with IDF soldiers, and both men had the same indirect message. Get ready for the ground invasion. Now to sum up, airstrikes continue in Gaza, anger is growing in the Muslim world, protests are escalating in the West Bank, attacks are more frequent at the Lebanon-Israel border, and U.S. military assets are being targeted. It's like a non-stop journey to all-out war. There are exit ramps all over. The question is, are leaders looking for an exit? Now let's look at what China's main geopolitical rival is up to, the United States of America. Their president, Joe Biden, was in Israel yesterday. He got back early this morning. It was a visit that lasted eight hours. And in those eight hours, he held a marathon of talks with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, with Israel's wartime cabinet, and with Egyptian President Abdel Fateh al-Sisi, basically everyone who was ready to talk to him. Then there were the speeches. Biden tried to show that he was walking a tightrope, that he was firmly behind Israel, but also cared about Palestinian civilians. And to display this, he kept focusing on one thing, humanitarian relief and aid to Gaza. And after he left Israel, Biden insisted that his talks with Israel were quote-unquote blunt. No, I, I was very blunt about the need to support getting humanitarian aid to Gaza, get it to Gaza and do it quickly, up to 20 trucks. This has been a very uh, blunt negotiation I've had. And I was, as you know, they probably told you, I was very blunt with the Israelis. Um, and uh, because look, Israel has been badly victimized, but you know, the truth is that if they have an opportunity to relieve the suffering of people who are, have nowhere to go, um, they're going to be, uh, it's what they should do. He kept repeating that word, blunt. He made it a point to let everyone know about his bluntness, about his insistence on getting aid to innocent Palestinians. So has the aid delivery started yet? 
Well, not yet. It's, 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 it's expected to begin tomorrow. And it may not last very long either because there's a catch. The people of Gaza need food, water, medicine, shelter. Today, I asked the Israeli cabinet, who I met with for some time this morning, to agree to the delivery of life-saving humanitarian assistance to civilians in Gaza, based on the understanding that there will be inspections and that the aid should go to civilians, not to Hamas. Israel agreed the humanitarian assistance can begin to move from Egypt to Gaza. But let me be clear. <clears throat> if Hamas diverts or steals the assistance, they will have demonstrated once again that they have no concern for the welfare of the Palestinian people. And it will end. <clears throat> As a practical matter, it will, it will stop the international community from being able to provide this aid. Hamas is the ruling regime in Gaza. They hold the ordinary Palestinians hostage. They use them as human shields. And yet, you expect them to allow aid to get freely distributed. Hamas has a long history of profiteering from anything coming into Gaza. They've imposed taxes and cuts. And that has made Hamas leaders millionaires. Are these people going to stay away from the aid? It sounds like a bad, cruel joke, or worse, mere tokenism. Hamas is not going to keep its hands off the aid, meaning the US and Israel will stop aid delivery soon enough, and we're back to square one. And Biden probably knows all of this, which is why he made some other promises as well. Today, I'm also announcing $100 million in new US funding for humanitarian assistance in both Gaza and the West Bank. This money will support more than 1 million displaced and conflict-affected Palestinians, including emergency needs in Gaza. Yes, that's Biden's solution. $100 million. Throw money at the problem and hope it goes away. And this is money that he doesn't even have. You may remember the headlines before this war began. The U.S. was staring at a government shutdown. They had a budget limit and they'd crossed that limit. So they had no money to run the government. And lawmakers barely managed to sign an interim deal. That deal was only for 45 days. It ends next month. And amid all of this, Biden promises $100 million to Palestine. He wants the world to believe that he will somehow convince American lawmakers. And he will somehow also ensure that the money doesn't go to Hamas. It's mission impossible and Joe Biden is not Tom Cruise. His statement seems disingenuous and that's putting it mildly. In the meantime, if some aid, however little, does go to the innocents in Gaza, it will be a relief. Till it does... There's the saying, talk is cheap, especially blunt talk. Now let's talk about the people who began this round of violence. The Hamas leadership, they planned the attack. They must have known the risks, but they gave the go ahead anyway. Do you wonder why? Because these so-called leaders had little to lose. They knew they will not be paying the price. They knew their own families would not be in the line of fire. I'm sure you already know this. The senior Hamas leadership is living the good life. They do not live in Gaza. They're safe with their families in other parts of the world. They don't have to face the Israeli airstrikes on Gaza. Instead, they hold high-level meetings and give speeches. They dictate the life and death of civilians in Gaza from their five-star safe havens. The definition of armchair generals. And one man exemplifies this, Ismail Hani, the Qatar-based chairman of the Hamas Political Bureau. Here he is in a literal armchair, seated next to Iran's foreign minister. They had a meeting in Qatar's capital, Doha, on Saturday. It was all smiles and congratulations. Iran's foreign minister reportedly praised the October 7th attack. He apparently called it a quote-unquote historic victory. And Ismail Hani said this, In the this strategic strike, the resistance strike, which recorded a glorious page in the history of our Palestinian people. What victory? What glory are they talking about? Thousands of people have died. Thousands more stand to lose their lives. And these are innocent civilians who are just going about their lives, both in Israel and in Palestine. Now a war is going on. Israel is asking Gazans to leave. The Israeli army will commence its ground operation any time now. It is telling people to evacuate North Gaza and the residents of North Gaza want to flee. 
They want to move south, perhaps even cross into Egypt. But Egypt doesn't want them and Hamas leaders say they should not go. There will be no migrating from Gaza and no migrating from the West Bank. No migrating from Gaza to Egypt. And here I would also like to salute the stance of our siblings in Egypt, who maintain that Egypt is indeed a country and is a sibling and a refuge and is welcoming to the Palestinian people, but not on the grounds of migration or displacement. And neither of us can ever accept that. And I say to my siblings in Egypt, our decision is to stay in our country. So your decision is our decision. You heard him. There will be no migrating from Gaza. Our decision is to stay in our, in our country. That's what the Hamas leader says. The problem is he himself is not in Gaza. Ismail Haniye divides his time between Qatar and Turkey. These are his two bases, and he keeps moving between the two. Same for his family. They do not stay in Gaza either. Most of them left in 2019. Some of them have Turkish passports. In fact, many senior leaders of Hamas have Turkish passports so they can move freely. But they're asking ordinary Gazans to stay put. Let me give you an important statistic. Before the war broke out, unemployment rate in Gaza was more than 60%, but Hamas leaders are millionaires. Their children are real estate tycoons with businesses in multiple countries. And this has led to resentment in the past. So what is Hamas's excuse? They say Ismail Haniye is on a foreign tour to rally support. That he's not abandoned Gaza, he's just traveling for the Palestinian cause. It's funny how long these tours last. Long enough to escape any danger and consequences. Also long enough to get foreign passports. Ismail Haniye's family has regularly been accused of corruption. They've reportedly made millions of dollars. They travel around the world. And now the same man is telling the people of Gaza to stay and face the bullets. The hypocrisy is staggering, though it's not limited to this man. Other senior Hamas leaders are also thriving in foreign nations, like Deputy Chairman Saleh al-Aruri. He's more often seen in Turkey than in Gaza, and he, he's always quick to give a soundbite to the press, always talking big about duty and sacrifice from their gilded armchairs in fancy hotels and conference halls. In fact, this hypocrisy spans most militant organizations. The Taliban leadership does not allow women to study, but their own daughters are studying in schools and universities abroad. Kashmiri separatists shut down schools in the valley, but their children went abroad to get an education. Everywhere you look, the game is rigged. Different rules for ordinary people, special privileges for the leaders and their families. Today we stand with all pride and dignity before this valiant resistance on the land of Gaza and extend into all of the land of Palestine. He said he stands with pride and dignity, but he doesn't stand among the people of Gaza. His children live lavish lifestyles while ordinary Gazan children starve, and that is a fact. Hanye and the rest do not face hardships with them. Instead, they're happy to send Palestinians to their graves while they bask in the glory of their sacrifice. Twenty-two countries, over 475 million people and an area of 13 million square kilometers. It's what we know as the Arab world. And this Arab world has picked a side in this war. They're all rallying behind Palestine. When Hamas attacked Israel on the 7th of October, a lot of Arab nations were quick to comment. Some directly condemned Hamas. Others just slammed the attack on Israel. They also talked about restraint and support to Palestine. But on Tuesday, the mood shifted and the positions hardened. A rocket hit Gaza's al Ali hospital. Hundreds of people were killed, and that seemed to be the red line for West Asia. Israel says it did not attack the hospital. It is even offering proof, video and audio proof, to show that this was a Palestinian rocket that misfired, that it was fired by the group called Palestinian Jihad. But it seems none of it matters now. By the time the Israeli denial came, the Arab world had already made its mind. All of them blamed Israel for the strikes. Their citizens took to the streets, their leaders called for accountability, and since then their stance has only toughened. 
Our meeting today comes in response to the tragic and violent developments taking place in the region and to study the dangerous situation of the escalation of military operations in the Gaza Strip and its surroundings and to declare our categorical rejection of the repeated assaults and increasing attacks by the Israeli occupation forces despite repeated appeals to immediately stop military operations, the victims of which are children and women and elderly defenseless civilians. That was the Foreign Minister of Saudi Arabia. Three weeks ago, Riyadh and Israel were discussing a peace deal, a deal that would change West Asia. 21 days later, the same Riyadh is condemning Israel in no uncertain terms, asking it to stop its assaults and attacks on Gaza. It shows you how fast the dynamics change. And there are a lot of factors at play here. The first, of course, are the peace deals. Israel and Arab nations may have signed those deals, but they did not bring peace. The region is on the brink of a wider conflict, one that could engulf the whole of West Asia. The long-standing issues run deep and extend well beyond the confines of Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory. The events of the past 11 days have served to reignite grievances and reanimate alliances across the region. Based on my meetings and the uh, dynamics I observe on the ground, I would say the following. The risk of an expansion of this conflict is real. Very, very real and extremely dangerous. So where does it stop? Israel is currently pounding Gaza. The next thing they want to do is invade the Strip and that could make things much worse. If the hospital strike was a red line, a ground invasion would be a point of no return for West Asia. And Iran has made it very clear. They said it was the beginning of the fall of Israel. Because of the attack on the hospital, the end of the Zionist regime will begin. With every drop of Palestinian blood spilled on the ground, the Zionist regime is one step closer to its fall. Which brings us to Tehran. Ever since the war broke out, Iran has said a lot. It warned Israel. It said it was ready to join the war. Its proxies were up in arms and now Iran wants an oil embargo. They want to stop the flow of oil into Israel. But Iran alone cannot make that decision. That would be the call of OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC. OPEC, it's an oil cartel. And so far, it has rejected calls for an oil embargo. But the very talk of it has spooked markets. You see, West Asia is central to the global oil economy. A third of the world's oil comes from here, from this region. If they impose an oil embargo, oil prices will skyrocket. And that would be disastrous for the global economy. It's not happening yet. But oil markets are wary because it will not be unprecedented if it happens. Arab states have done this before. In 1973, Arab states launched a war against Israel. They then imposed an oil embargo. As it turned out, they did not win the war. But the fact is, they were united. And 50 years later, the same thing is happening. The Arab world has been dragged into yet another war. They may still be projecting unity and rallying behind Palestine. And they have their fault lines. Their support for Palestine has its limits. And those limits are showing now. Each Arab state is looking at this conflict nervously. Jordan and Egypt fear an exodus of refugees. Gulf nations fear antagonizing Iran. And Saudi Arabia fears Iranian proxies lashing out. So they may all pretend that this is about the survival of Palestine, but chances are it is more about their own survival. The war is in Gaza, but a new front has opened thousands of kilometers away in Western colleges. Many student organizations have taken sides. Their statements have raised eyebrows. Like at, at Harvard, students at Harvard released a statement after the Hamas attack, and guess who they blamed for this? They blamed Israel. The students blamed Israel's past policies for the attack. Elsewhere, we've seen protests. Like at New York's Columbia University, hundreds of students gathered for dueling protests. One group supported Palestine, the other supported Israel. Classes were cancelled after fears of a clash. Jewish students said anti-Semitism was on the rise. 
Students who were attacked for speaking Hebrew and for hanging up signs denouncing Hamas. There are people over there who are cheering with Palestinian flags after women were raped and stripped and then taken their dead corpses paraded through the streets of Gaza. Now, some of this hatred has been toned down. Like at Harvard, a few of the students who wrote that statement have distanced themselves. Why? Because it's hurting their future. Major donors have asked colleges to condemn the Hamas attack, plus employers are blacklisting these students. Like hedge fund billionaire Bill Ackman, he has asked Howard to release the names of students who supported Hamas. He wants to blacklist them. And the threat clearly worked, because some of the students withdrew their statements. Now we can debate this tactic all we want to. Is blacklisting students for their opinions a good thing? Or will it further alienate them? U.S. presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy thinks it's a bad idea. He says these students are quote-unquote simple fools. But he also says blacklisting them is not productive. Ramaswamy called it dumb political statements. But what shapes these so-called dumb opinions? It is important to understand that. Because supporting Hamas is not just dumb, it's also dangerous. So why are these students doing it? One reason could be the faculty. Your lessons and classes influence your opinions. Let me tell you what happened at Stanford. Again, a storied Western college. A lecturer pulled up Jewish students in an undergraduate class at Stanford. He made them stand in a corner and he then told the class, this is what Israel does to Palestinians. The same lecturer also called an Israeli student a colonizer. He's been suspended now, but you get an idea of what goes on. The same Stanford is yet to condemn Hamas. Their statement only talks about death and human suffering. Yale University is another example. One of their professors had a controversial take on the Hamas attack. She said, settlers are not civilians. In other words, do not mourn the Israeli victims. They had it coming. Settlers are not civilians. And how did Yale respond to this? They said it's freedom of expression. That the comments represented her personal views. How is that not a problem? We are talking about a professor here, someone who shapes the opinions of an entire generation. Surely her personal views are important. Would Yale do the same if she said 9-11 was fake? I bet the action would be stricter. So the faculty and colleges must take some of the blame. Because this is not about rebellious teenagers. This is about wrong ideas, about equating terrorism with resistance. These are two very different things. That doesn't mean colleges should censor students or hurt their career prospects. But they should point them in the right direction. Isn't that the whole point of colleges? Yes, there is debate. Yes, there are conflicting opinions. But there are always guardrails, lines that must never be crossed by students. Surely supporting terrorism falls beyond that line. We have nothing against students supporting Palestine. Some of them have genuine concerns, but also condemn Hamas. In an ideal campus, both would be possible. And there are students doing just that, like this Jewish student in New York pointed out. Quite frankly, the support from my Muslim friends as well. Uh, all of the Muslim people who I know who I'm close with have reached out to ask if I'm OK and to see how my family's doing. It's just when it becomes impersonal, um, people feel much more comfortable calling for violence. And I think that's not OK. Sums up the problem. Colleges can be a radical experience for students. You're exposed to freedom, you're exposed to new ideas, and in that rush, you can get carried away. You become militant in your opinions and politics. You fail to hear or understand the other side. Now, most students outgrow this phase. But who knows? Maybe a tiny minority will not. They will continue their pro-Hamas politics into adulthood. And who takes the blame for that? Not these colleges, for sure. This war has also reignited an old debate. Who is a terrorist? Whatever the definition, you think Hamas qualified. They killed more than 1,400 innocent Israelis. Even children were not spared. If that's not terrorism, I don't know what is. But tell that to the BBC. They don't call Hamas terrorists. They call them Palestinian militants or fighters. 
And the British Prime Minister has a problem with that. Here's what his officials are saying, and I'm quoting. The Prime Minister has said repeatedly that Hamas are not militants, they are terrorists. It is incumbent on our national broadcaster to recognize that. The national broadcaster is the BBC. And it's not just Rishi Sunak. One of the hostages taken by Hamas is the mother of a therapist in London. He wants the BBC to change its policy to call Hamas terrorists. So why don't they do it? Why don't they call them terrorists? Well, the BBC's position was explained by their world affairs editor, John Simpson. Listen to his justification. This is what he said. Terrorism is a loaded word which people use about an outfit they disapprove of morally. It's simply not the BBC's job to tell people who to support and who to condemn. Who are the good guys and who are the bad guys? How about that? It is not the BBC's job to tell people who the good guys are. But guess what? The job has been flipped because people are now telling the BBC who the bad guys are. And among them is the British Prime Minister. And frankly, it's not that tough. If you kill children, you are not one of the good guys. If you massacre a village, same thing. Yet many groups find it difficult to accept that, to accept that Hamas is a terror group. I know some people romanticize the concept. They say one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. They are wrong too. Killing innocent civilians is not a fight for freedom. It is bloodlust. And this happens across the world. Consider the situation in Kashmir. In February 2019, the Pulwama attack happened. A bus carrying Indian security officials was bombed. 40 of them were killed. And what did the BBC say? That militants attacked the bus. Not terrorists, but militants. We're talking about the Jaish-e Mohammed here. A bona fide terrorist group. One that is sanctioned and listed by the United Nations Security Council, yet the BBC called them militants. Do you see the problem here? Words determine the scale and seriousness of the attack. A terrorist is different from a militant. Let's look at the, uh, the dictionary definitions. Who is a terrorist? Someone who uses violence for political purposes. And who is a militant? Someone who is determined and often willing to use force. So there is a clear difference. When you call a terrorist a militant, you downplay their threat. It's like calling a heart attack a chest pain. Technically, you're not wrong, but in reality, there is a huge difference. So what's the solution here? To be honest, we are very far from any solution because there is no agreement on the definition. There is no globally accepted definition of what is terrorism or who is a terrorist. As a result, you get different versions. For some, they're freedom fighters. For others, like the BBC, they're militants. India has highlighted this problem at the United Nations. It said that the UN is yet to agree on a common definition, let alone craft a coherent policy on terrorism. It tells you why we need a definition. Because you cannot tackle something that you can't even define. I know that circumstances are different everywhere. So is the history and the experiences. But those factors cannot justify actions of violence because then you're on a slippery slope. Just think about it. Assume that we accept the fact that one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Great. But then, who defines what freedom is? What if one man's freedom is another man's tyranny? So don't let causes or history color your definitions. A terrorist is a terrorist because of their actions, because of their choices. Calling them anything else is an insult to the victims. Now let's talk about another arrival, one that's touted to change warfare as we know it. But first a question, what is the biggest problem with Israel's Iron Dome system? I would argue it's the cost. Each Israeli interceptor missile costs about $50,000. But what if Israel had a cost-effective way to stop the rockets, a way to hit one rocket after another endlessly without having to worry about its expensive interceptors running out? Sounds ideal, right? Well, it may become reality soon because Israel is reportedly rolling out a new defense system. It's the stuff of sci-fi movies. Israel calls it its defensive trump card. It's the iron beam anti-missile laser system. Our next report tells you what's the iron beam and how it can be a game changer. 
Look at this video from last year. That's US President Joe Biden getting ready for a photo shoot. It's at the Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv. What's all the fuss for? Look at what's above his head. The giant camera lens-like thing. That's the reason for all this excitement. Because it's Israel's ace in the hole. The Iron Beam Laser Anti-Missile System. The Iron Beam is a technological marvel. The fruit of years of research in high-intensity lasers. It was first unveiled at a Singapore air show in 2014. And after seven years, it seems to be ready for battlefield action. The system was made for one thing, taking down aerial threats before they hit Israel. First, let's look at its stats. The Iron Beam reportedly has a range of between 7 to 10 kilometers. Israel has said it can focus the beam to the diameter of a coin within that distance. The Iron Beam fires lasers that can reach energy levels of about 100 kilowatts. For context, that's about 24 grams of TNT exploding every second. Or almost one and a half kgs of dynamite every minute. That's the amount of energy coming out of the iron beam. All this will be directed at incoming missiles, drones, rockets and any other aerial threat. Here's a video released by Israel's Defense Forces last year, showing a successful test of the iron beam. How it works is simple. The laser will be fired at key spots on the incoming projectiles. In missiles, this means the fins, rudder or the warhead. Damaging the fins and rudder will destabilize the missile's flight path, make it change course. Firing at the warhead could overheat and cripple the detonator, rendering the missile useless. It's similar when engaging with drones. Either ruin the wings or propellers, or fry the camera, leaving the drone operator blind. But this method has a drawback, when it comes to kamikaze drones and rockets especially. These are simple weapons used for destruction. Wherever they land, they will explode. So changing their path may protect critical targets, but some damage will still be done. Which is why Israel isn't going to replace all its systems with the iron beam. The laser is meant to augment, not replace, Israel's existing missile defense systems. It will try and mop up the projectiles that slip through the Iron Dome. Like a short-range laser defense support system. That could be the initial plan anyway. But the Iron Beam and other lasers will get stronger over time. They could eventually replace other costlier systems. While building the Iron Beam certainly isn't cheap, Using it is relatively cost-effective. Israel says it will cost about $2,000 to destroy an incoming threat using the Iron Beam. Compare that to $50,000 per Iron Dome interceptor missile. You can see why Israel will want to improve the laser tech as time goes by. But even today, the Iron Beam's deployment will mark a milestone, signaling the beginning of the age of laser warfare.